It was so good, Stan. We oh, haven't, yeah, so good. We, haven't won, yeah. we haven't wanted your we have not wanted your basketball analysis all season. Half a season has been played. <laughs> we have not wanted to talk to you, but as soon as you went full old white guy uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and had this back and forth with Kevin Durant, I've got to find it real quick here so that I can. Uh, In the meantime, go. retroactively hitting you with a. <laughs> I will. Uh, I read yesterday to Amin. Amin disagrees with you, Stan, on something I thought you were saying that was perfectly fair, which is, I'm going to paraphrase here, that in the 90s there was just a strength coach and a conditioning coach and guys played more games and they played back-to-backs and they practiced harder and now injuries are up and uh, there's rest is being valued and guys are missing games right and left. And Kevin Durant wrote, attached to what Stan was saying, Stan's spitting. You received that how, Stan? You spit thought in. Spit, spit in. Spitting with an apostrophe. Big difference, yep. Okay, you can hit me with the white guys, too. Oh, Spitting with an apostrophe, and you received that how? You were immediately mortified uh, because you thought... I wasn't kept... mortified. No, I just thought he was disagreeing with me. And what did you think spitting meant? I didn't really have any idea. I just thought he was at some point disagreeing with me. So <laughs> that's Kevin I tried Durant. to clarify myself. I didn't know exactly. Um, but now I know because virtually everybody uh, that I know uh, told me. So it is so real and so true that you simply assume that Kevin Durant was disagreeing with you because that's what Kevin Durant does on Twitter. <laughs> It's all he does. Well, that really wasn't why, because I've never really engaged with Kevin Durant on Twitter, so it wasn't anything to do with him. I, I just, other than the fact, you know, he's a he's a player today, um, and I thought that he was possibly taking it as a ta- an attack on players, which is not what I uh, was not what I meant. So I tried to clarify that. Stan, I agree with you. Stan, I agree with it you. It was so good from <laughs> Kevin Durant. He, he did. He did the translation for you is what he did. He said, okay, yes, you he did. Yes, he did it for me. And uh, we have a game of theirs uh, in a couple of weeks here in Brooklyn, and I uh, I will thank him in person. <laughs> but, I mean, tell Stan why you disagree with him, because uh, he's not factually wrong. The The way that he's presenting the context, right. he is correct that guys are missing more games, injuries are up, and now there are giant performance staffs. Yeah, I, I uh, what I told Dan, Stan, is that the reason why guys played 82 games or as many games as possible back then is because that's what people did. And there was no concept that if I don't play every game, I might be a little better when it matters. And so once that genie gets out of the bottle, the race is for everybody to have this same sort of management of of load, of of games played, of minute, whatever, however you want to define it. Now, you know, Michael Jordan played 82 games in 1998, right? But... It, I likened it to being in a building with no elevator. We all take the steps. But the moment an elevator gets installed, you're going to realize, man, the guys taking the elevator, they got a lot more energy during the day, and I'm slogging energy just going up steps. Why am I slogging this energy? Why am I expending this energy? And what ends up happening is everyone says, well, I want to take the elevator too, and that's what's happened. Yeah, but well, more people not- are... That's not the point, though. The point is this. I I understand that thinking. The point is this, though. Even with all of the load management and the change in that, actual injuries and people being out for injury is way up. And so at some point, when do you say, hey, this isn't really working. Maybe this theory we have isn't right. And at least not right for everybody, because, I mean, injuries are up. And more importantly, soft tissue injuries are up. The hamstring pulls, the groin pulls, things like that, they are up. That should concern every team in the league, and everybody should have at least the curiosity to say, are we doing this right? 
And I don't see teams doing that. I just see that across the league, it's accepted that the less we do, the less we demand of players, the better it is. Well, then why are we having more injuries? Stan is spitting. (laughs) Stan uh, I just want to explain to the audience what's been happening and we'll get back to your serious conversation in a second but Chris Cody has gotten back on the treadmill he's polluted from all things (laughs) Buffalo over the last three days he's polluted and things yeah you move very quickly (laughs) around here you could it just it moves fast and he tried to at the start of when you were talking He tried to pick an open window with good timing where he was going to speak the joke which would have been funny but guys are getting injured on the elevator. And, uh, it, but you guys stepped on each other. And so he spent the last 60 ah. seconds kicking the air in oh, the back God. room and just being like, because ah, he had the window for Long the joke. pauses. He tried to feed it to me first, but today is not a day to no, feed me. This is okay? a bad combination. I mean, physically, I'm here, but this, I'm still in Mexico. This is okay? a bad I mean, combination. I'm Chris still in Co- Buffalo. I, my, yes, my teammates today, I've got to do this. Vegas here. <laughs> oh, shit. Everyone is polluted. But I mean, you wanted to say something about the soft tissue injury yeah i i forgot about that part of the the argument the the other part of this stan is that players today we're seeing these are the generations of players that became hyper focused and specialized at a young age and played year round whereas earlier generations of players in our league like a participated in other sports growing up and b did not have that same sort of hyper focus with training and drills. So what's happening is there's wear and tear, basketball wear and tear on joints and and soft tissue, uh, tendons, uh, uh, ligaments, et cetera, that's happening at a much higher rate by the time a guy's even 25 years old compared to a 25-year-old from 20 years ago. I'm not buying any of that either. 20 years ago, guys played a lot more basketball growing up than they do now. Everybody talks about the AAU. Yeah, instead of playing two AAU games on a Saturday where the guy maybe plays 30 minutes in each game, guys played six hours on the playground. Like, I'm not buying any of this. And the the problem I have, listen, I don't have a problem with people coming up with a theory on how to better preserve players and have them ready for the playoffs and lengthen careers and all that. What I have a problem with, I mean, is right now, everybody's just got this herd mentality and no one in our league is even willing to question this and say, injuries are going way up, guys. This is the way we've been doing it now progressively more and more. Work less, rest more. We've been doing this for years now and it's progressively gotten to this point where teams really don't practice at all, okay? and they play fewer back-to-backs, and and injuries are going up. Why is it someone saying, maybe we're doing it wrong? I'm not saying that necessarily we are. What I'm saying is, why is no one even questioning it? Like, even though injuries are going up, I mean, Mm -hmm. everybody just assumes that we're taking the exact right approach. Can we bring it back to the tweet? What would have been a good response by Kevin Durant that Stan would have understood? Should he have been like, here, here, Stan? <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have needed to be that that direct and that obvious. Yes. I want like his his follow up, his follow up, Chris got that was good, right? That's so good. He said, I agree with you. Okay. That, that I understood, yes. It was the stand in front of that. Yeah. Stan, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Hands out, right? Yeah. Stan. It. it was. Uh, Amin's got this right. He just had his hands out. I'm not here to fight. Right, I'm yes. not. I don't want any problems. Stan, like he's telling, <laughs> that Stan is meant to calm Stan down. Stan, Stan, I'm agreeing with you, please. Whatever your, Back un- off. Whatever your unreasonable rage is, please. Uh, Kevin Durant was being so gentle with you, Stan, while you took it as disagreement and. Uh... <laughs> Oops. 
<laughs> That's the guy who hasn't been Vegas, Buffalo, or he's just uh, been here. Miami, 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 Miami for him. Uh, Holy I, shit! I told Amin before the show because I mean, for some reason, it's the strangest thing. We're doing show, yeah. and always the first twelve seconds in, he knocks over a cowbell. Yeah. He hits a hotel ringing bell. I'm like, why are all these things here? He compared himself to the orchestra right before it starts. Yeah, the, the person tuning their violin. <laughs> A stray sound before it starts, though. Yeah, yes, that's, that's, the, that's before it starts. That's, that's, that's not the way Amin does it. Uh, Stan, John Morant, is he fucking around? <laughs> I don't have any idea what you're talking about right now, and I'm very sensitive to not knowing what people are talking about. At this point. How good is this person? Is what he's asking. I mean, you. he's not fucking around, Stan. No, he's really, really good. Um, he's not the only one, though. I mean, we have seen the stars. Uh, just absolutely take over. I mean, I think more and more now it's we just take the stars, and I'm not even saying this is wrong. It's certainly working for teams. We take the stars and we give them the ball on every possession, and so the the usage the usage rates are way up, and these guys are getting more and more opportunities to show what they can do, and it is spectacular. Stan, I was talking to a mean off air about this the other day because I feel like I'll be watching a Hawks game and I'm like, oh my God, Murray is more skilled as a basketball player than anyone I've seen the last 30 years, but there are 30 guys in this league more skilled than he is. The skill level of what I'm watching, I wonder, I'm curious you how you view it as someone who's inside it. The skill level of the basketball being played offensively to me. I know people want to criticize the defense, but the offensive skill of basketball is at a higher level than I've ever seen it with these guys, you know, with Vucevic being somebody who exists as I'm going to score from three and I'm going to score 40 plus points. And I, but the skill level is absurd. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it gets better and better every year. I mean, there's, there's no question that it's by far the highest it has ever been. Um, and you know what? I don't think you, you can even just measure it by the stars because, you know, we've always had stars that were skilled, and they, those guys may be more skilled now, but the depth of skill, you know, as we go down the roster, I mean, you know, we're doing the Golden State, uh, Boston game tonight, and everywhere you look, there's guys shooting 40% from three. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's incredible. I mean, Al Horford is seventh in the league in three-point shooting. Yeah, he is. As, as an old 6'10 guy. I mean, old. It, the, the skill level is incredible. Um, and I think what's, what's remarkable, too, are the guys like Al Horford and Brooke Lopez who have kept up with the game as it is advanced and adjusted their games to what was going to what's needed today. So the skill level is incredible watching these guys every night. You just see things that are astounding. I had the conversation on air here with Spencer Hall the other day. He did not think that today's Carolina Panthers would be able to trample the 1985 Bears. I do. I believe the science on all this stuff has gotten to a point where today's players are a lot better. So Spencer Dinwiddie is on the Buckets podcast, and he's saying, I'd be a god in the 50s. In the 50s, if I played, I'd be a god. But <laughs> it, how far back do I have to go to keep with a means conversation of when things become oldies in music? before I get to Michael Jordan, before I get somebody willing to say, when I played during Michael, jo if I played during Michael Jordan's age, I'd be the God. Because we go into the 50s and we do it, but I think we can go back into the 80s and do it too. No, you can't. Yeah, my son is 28 years old, and in any sport, he doesn't even want to hear about anyone who played before the 80s. Like, if you start bringing up guys you know, that played before the 80s. Like, he's not even going to listen to you. He won't give a lot of credit to anyone who played in the 80s and 90s, but he's not even listening about anyone who played um, <laughs> before the 80s. But I don't think that's... It, it's all true. I mean, players are a lot better today. It's all true. I mean, that's the way evolution sort of works. Um, but I don't think it's fair either because... I think what we're leaving out, had we taken those guys 
from those eras and raise them the same way with the same training things and everything else, you know, where would they be now? I think you have to compare. I think athletes need to be compared to um, the eras they played in. Um, but yes, I mean, today, you know, like my son will say to me all the time, my son played high school baseball. Dan, you were a baseball player. I mean, my son will say Babe Ruth couldn't make my high school, <laughs> you know, today. He said the guy was pitching, throwing 70 miles an hour and hitting off guys throwing 70 miles an hour. So, yeah, athletes are just a lot better today. It's all changed. Dan was a baseball player. <laughs> My dream died when? in center field, double A. Uh, center field. Stan, I, I told I told the guys this story a couple of weeks ago. When I when I worked in Phoenix in 2010, we ended the season with the fourth highest offensive rating in NBA history, and now we're outside of like the top 25. And when you look at the top 25, 20 of them have happened in the last three seasons since 2021. 21-22, and this season. 20 of the top 25 NBA offenses of all time. At what point does the league say we need to adjust the rules and tinker it back to, to give defenses a chance? I don't know. I think the game is, is pretty good right now. I, I think that, you know, there there's three things I think that have, have led led us to where we are offensively the skill of the players which we've we've already talked about the rules changes over the the rules changes and how the game is is called so it's a far less physical game so we can say oh the athletes are a lot better and and all of that but you know when tim hardaway was working for me in detroit um, we would talk all the time about, can you imagine Tim Hardaway and guys like that going out in an era like now where you can't hand check people mm -hmm. and things like that, especially the young Tim Hardaway when he came in the league. You got to understand, as much as we want to say athletes are better, and they are, also the rules are different. Ja Moran, all those guys would look a lot different if defenses could play the way they played in the 90s and you've got to factor that in a little bit so the skill the rules changes and the fact that just people practice a lot less and i think what suffers there is defense and preparation the defenses aren't quite as good as they were because we're not spending the time um to get teams ready to play because we got to rest everybody so that they can play three out of every four nights so that they then can have something left in the playoffs where they still sit out games, even in the playoffs. So that's what we've got to do. And so that cuts into defenses. I want to ask you guys both about the trade deadline and who's going to do what the heat or uh, unconfirmed reports. They're interested in Bogdanovich and Kuzma. They need uh, rebounding. Duncan Robinson is someone that uh, it is said that they are working hard to convince other teams. Hey, you want this contract? <laughs> Who needs what Stan? And what do the heat need? Well, I, I mean, the Heat, to me, actually need quite a bit. I mean, uh, they, they need they could use more size um, for sure. Um, and, and people who can help them, you know, rebound the ball and could help them on the defensive end with more size. I mean, they could certainly use to bring Jay Crowder back. But everybody is going to have an interest. Listen, if a good player is available, um, everybody has interest in them. And so, you know, I, you know me as much as the, the trade rumor stuff. I mean, it can't even be 1% of the rumored trades that actually happen. I mean, we can throw everything out there. And, and by the way, I said, if a player is available, every player in the NBA is available. They always have been. Um, this idea of teams coming out, I get it for the PR part of it with their own guys saying, oh, no, this guy's not available. That's a bunch of BS. Everybody's looking to get better. And so, you know, the simple part on the trade deadline is everybody's trying to get as good of players as they can, giving up as little as they can. That's it. That's the entire summary. 
Yeah, the the Dan the Heat have been excellent defensively. They they're but in a weird way. I don't Stan. I don't know if you've seen this before. They don't foul, right? They keep their opponent off the free throw line. They're an excellent rebounding team. They force, oh, I think either the number one or number two team in the league in terms of forcing turnovers as a percentage of the other team's uh, possessions. But they're bottom five in field goal percentage allowed, effective field goal percentage allowed. They can't stop anybody, but it doesn't matter because the other three things generate the bulk of their defense. But the biggest difference between last year and this year is this team is not a good three-point shooting team. This was an elite three-point shooting team a year ago, and this year they're not. And you say, what's going on? What went wrong? Well, the number one thing that's gone wrong for them is they don't make wide-open threes. Last year, a top-five team in wide-open threes shooting – this year, a bottom five team in wide open. Stan, threes. explain that not as it relates to the Heat, because I know many people listening to this don't want us to be talking any more Miami stuff. They're very sacred about that. But just explain that to me in general. Duncan Robinson, I could have made the argument, had the best playoff shooting game I've ever seen against the Atlanta Hawks going nine for 10 and just being ridiculous from three point range. How does that disappear? Yeah, um, it, it's really interesting with the Heat because it. It Duncan Robinson has gotten worse every year. So he went from his first full season uh, where they went into the bubble and, and the whole thing, he was, he was great. Then the next year he was still very good, but not quite as good by all his numbers. And then last year he was mediocre. And this year he got to the point that even before he had the uh, surgery on his finger that he wasn't even playable like Eric wouldn't play him but it's beyond him Max Drews has not shot the ball nearly as well until very recently Gabe Vincent hadn't shot the ball nearly as well the bottom line is they're undrafted players that we all raved about um, for very good reason have looked like undrafted players uh, for for the good part of the year so it's not that they're underachieving maybe they had overachieved before but the the Duncan Robinson story, to me, is is strange. You know, it really is for all those guys, but for a, an organization that is rightfully lauded for player development and everything, and they developed all of those guys, they've all taken big steps back now, and Duncan Robinson the most, and it's sort of mystifying to me. I uh, put together a top five. What? A top five... Center field names if Dan actually made it to the bigs. <laughs> oh, wow. <Yeah. laughs> Roy, Roy exclaiming center field, and I'm yelling it's at him. Odd, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the joke, but that's the joke. Any other position is ridiculous, but now double A center fielder. I'm covering a lot of range because the left fielder <laughs> is handcuffed. I can get into the gap. Uh, that's the only him. position that would have been ridiculous. Yeah. Huh? I mean, can, well, it's the most ridiculous. Shut I think. Up. I think it's the most. Can, if I said catcher it's no, not as funny no. as center field no we can see you as a catcher and a first, first baseman. baseman we cannot yeah. see you roaming I, center I, I field that or i think like <laughs> maybe except for second base a specialist reliever dan at the uh, yes dress. we uh, we have two olis we have adam eaton <laughs> and kenny loft ton <laughs> <laughs> Number five. <laughs> Whose is that? I don't know. Uh, that's got to be Stan's. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. Uh, number five. Grady plus size more. <laughs> number four. Denard Spam. <laughs> I prefer Darvin Ham. Different sport. Yeah. Uh, number three is just Coco Crisp. <laughs> number two. Chili's Davis. <laughs> <laughs> And number one, Curtis Grandy, son. <laughs> the Grandy man. Yeah. No, that's the white guys. Yeah. Curtis Grande, son. Oh, there you go.